discussion today is assessment of renal functions and its uh, clinical implications. Uh, if I were to put up the slide and ask you how many of you have heard about these functions, as in the clearance test, the DTPA, the IOTHALAMATE GFR, or the, the uh, uh, PTTA GFR, or as a matter of fact, even the protein loading <coughs> test, or, or test for renal tubular functions, as in beta-2 microglobulin, alpha-2 microglobulin, RBG, <coughs> urinary cystatin C, kidney injury molecule, I'm sure all of you would say we've not heard of it. And I think it's futile and useless to discuss this topic if, if you have to assess renal function. So what instead I've done is, I'll be talking about the commonly ordered tests, the, the tests which you prescribe on your daily basis, which is the urea, creatinine, the, the calcium, phosphorus, the urinary routine and microscopy, a blood gas occasionally, and the ultrasound, which is a part and parcel of our diagnostics nowadays. The concept today is that at the end of the lecture or, or the uh, uh, talk, you should be able to interpret these basic tests in an appropriate manner, keeping the clinical <coughs> background in uh, mind. You should know when to refer. You should be able to differentiate between true pathology versus a non-pathological uh, significance. And you should understand emergency conditions based on these labs. So who should you assess a renal function as well? Nowadays, it is used routinely as a part of uh, your initial investigation. So whosoever walks into your clinic is at least supposed to have a kidney function test or a urine routine examination. Besides that, all elderly people, all patients who've had family history of chronic kidney disease or diabetes <coughs> or hypertension, those who've had recurrent UTIs in the past or had history of stone disease should be subjected to these basic renal function tests. Well, the commonly encountered diseases or the syndromes which we see uh, in your clinical practices are, is the acute kidney injury, so-called, which was previously known as ARF, is now replaced by the term kidney injury. The CRF, which has been replaced by the term chronic <coughs> kidney disease. You could have an acute exacerbation of a pre-existing chronic kidney disease. You could have a patient who presents with a rapidly progressive renal failure or nephrotic syndrome. So once you understand these basic syndromes, I would like to now uh, tell you uh, briefly about how, how would you differentiate in your clinical setup between an acute kidney disease and a chronic kidney disease. These are pointers, these, these are not 100% uh, uh, foolproof. However, a short history would point to an acute renal disease. Uh, a normal kidney size again would point to an uh, acute renal failure. Anemia is unusual if the disease is short duration, so it will be more towards pointing towards a chronic kidney disease. Similarly, raised levels of phosphate or urinary casts would point to a chronic kidney disease. Similarly, if you find an uh, LVH on an echocardiography or you find changes in the fundus, it would suggest that the disease process has been going on for quite some time and it's all chronic. So basically, based on these four or five uh, clinical examination history, you could possibly figure out whether you're dealing with an acute kidney disease or a chronic kidney disease patient. So uh, I wanted to make this more interactive. So I'm throwing up a case uh, for the uh, audience here. So this is a 68-year-old lady who walks in with complaints of a decreased appetite for one month. She is your follow-up. She has been hypertensive for the last five years on amlodipin. You examine her, you find some pallor, some pedal edema. Rest is within normal limits. Her body weight is 48 kgs. Her blood pressure is 160 or 90. The pulse is just fine. She's anemic. She has a hemoglobin of 9.2. She has some elevated urea, her creatinine is 2.4, her sodium is fine, but her potassium is 5. You do a urine routine and you find the urine has a protein of 1 plus and no cas. So what's your approach now? Anyone from the audience? You could have a look here again for a, for a second or so. Right. Right, so the BP is high, so somebody would like to treat her with ACE and ARBs. Right. Uh, what about the potassium? So you're not paying attention to the potassium here. Sir. So it, because the potassium is high and you can't use ACE and ARBs, you would probably like to treat her with calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. All of these answers could be right, and none of them could be, you know, it could be a mixture of uh, many answers here, but it's just to throw, a, you know, uh, for your appetite. Or you could possibly add a diuretic for pedal edema. Now, how many of you would refer to a nephrologist or plan and discuss dialysis at this stage? Or probably investigate further? Any, any, anyone? <laughs> right, so what investigate are, investigation are we looking at? Creatinine clearance, microalbumin. Great, very good, sir. 
So let me come to the GFR now. In a sense, the lady <coughs> also had a creatinine of 2.4. However, if you assess the renal function here, and, and GFR is nothing but it, it's, it's a clearance, which is a hypothetical clearance of quantity of blood or plasma, which is completely cleared of a substance in a unit of time. It is ideally measured by inulin. However, the test is not practical. It is not done anymore. A lot of people would go into for a DTPA GFR to see what the renal function is like, but it is expensive. So now, what we usually do in our clinical practices, follow a simple formula to calculate what we call as an estimated GFR, which is calculated by the CG formula. All you need is age and body weight, and if and if, and and if you, in fact, in your practice, if you send the weight of your patient, which the lab will not have, they could actually give you the eGFR. eGFR has advantages. It is easily calculated on this formula. It is reproducible. It can be used to monitor progress. It is more meaningful than urea and creatine, and I'll just tell you why in the next few slides. And there are inherent problems with serum creatinine. The relation between the, the creatinine and the GFR is, you know, uh, if you were to see, when the GFR falls from 100 to 50, the creatinine barely rises. On your y-axis, the creatinine is not even rising. You can see the two arrows merging. So it's actually when the, when the GFR is falling much uh, lower than that, the creatinine starts rising. So it's, it's quite deceptive to actually see the creatinine because the creatinine may be normal and the GFR is falling. The, the other discrepancy with creatinine is that you could have a high serum creatinine with normal GFR. You could get a spurious elevation with cephalosporins in diabetic ketoacidosis. Patients who are alcoholic who have taken vitamin C or who are on drugs like cimetidine or trimethoprim which block tubular secretion. Also, uh, pe uh, people who eat a lot of non-vegetarian food could have an uh, elevation of serum creatinine with normal GFR. So what I mean to say is creatinine is, is not to be uh, followed as sacrosanct and you know, you follow patient with creatinine because it could be deceptive. All the same, you could also have normal serum creatinine with CKD, wherein patients who are severely malnourished, and I'll come to that first slide again, who are elderly, that was a 68-year-old lady, who are of small size, and ladies of small size, yes. So, so if you were to calculate the eGFR by a simple CG formula, you would find that this lady has a GFR or a renal reserve of only 17 ml per minute to this audience. Is this chronic kidney disease? Now, if it is chronic kidney disease, what stage is it? Yes, almost near yes. Sir. Right. And how does staging help? Yes, right. So, yeah, a lot of you are uh, correct in a way. This is chronic kidney disease. And the KDO in 2003 came up with this, uh, this uh, wonderful classification. Now, this was essentially based on uh, risk stratification. And if you see when the GFR or your estimated GFR comes to between 30 and 60, that's where the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality comes into picture. So if you don't address these issues, at this, uh, if you keep on following creatinine, you will never know the GFR, you will not realize when to address these issues. So, and as a matter of fact, as you go down, you reach the ESRD stage, and, and stage where you know, the GFR falls between 15. However, if you're not able to place a fistula on time, the mortality is much higher. If you're not able to refer on time, the mortality is much higher. So in that lady where the creatinine was only 2.4, and people were trying to control the blood pressure, which is also fine, it is more important for her to be referred so that she can have an early initiation and, and you know, the, the program of uh, chronic kidney disease uh, starts. Uh, that was the, the first theme today. So, yeah, we, we were talking about further investigations. I would have done a kidney size on her to see whether this is actually acute or chronic. However, there's a caveat. You could also have chronic kidney disease wherein the size of the kidney is normal, as in diabetic nephropathy, hypertension, HIV nephropathy, and some infiltrative disorders. Now, if I continue the case, and this is interesting, and we do an ultrasound and find this is normal kidney size, uh, and we investigate further, we found that she's drowsy, her calcium is 13.8, the albumin is low, and creatinine has increased to 3. So what's your approach now? It's a normal kidney, you call it an AKI. She could still have a CKD with normal kidney. You refer to nephrologist because the creatinine has increased, or you refer to nephrologist because the calcium has increased. Yeah, this brings me to a very important concept, <coughs> which is the indication for urgent dialysis. Most of you would be knowing these indications, but a lot of us should also understand a severe hypercalcemia also is an indication for urgent dialysis, more so in patients who are, who are in encephalopathy. And why I wanted to bring, bring hypercalcemia into this slide, there's a reason behind it, because a lot of us, a lot of us are writing calcium day in, day out, uh, day in, day out, uh, without justification. And there was this recent article I could come across in 2000, uh, this is 2013, 
this is a meta-analysis, meta-analysis of about 50,000 patients. They, they found 2,600 2, major cardiovascular events. And they, they reported that calcium supplementation might increase the risk of major events, and more so in males. Uh, you'll have to give me some more time because this is, this is more interactive and, yeah, I'm sorry for that. Right, so what the, the key message here is that lady probably was on calcium supplementation. These are real life case scenarios. And, uh, and uh, the hypercalcemia was probably iatrogenic, and we are all responsible for inducing this hypercalcemia because we are prescribing calcium in all our patients, uh, and I just failed to understand why. Because in long term, it has found that long term calcium supplementation does not have any preventive role in osteoporosis as well, and my orthopedic colleagues would quite agree there. Right, so coming back to acute kidney injury, it could be pre renal or it could be tubular necrosis. When I say uh, the risk factors for acute kidney injury, all elderly patients, all diabetics, or all patients who have had pre previous kidney disease are at risk for acute renal failure. The most common causes are again pre renal or ATN. So coming back to your dengue now, this is what you have been dealing with all of you. So this young male presents with headache and vomiting. He's, he's kind of hypertensive. His pressure, the, uh, the pulse is fine. His NS1 positive. Platelets are 90,000. His urea is elevated. The creatinine is fine. So what do you think the cause of renal failure is? <coughs> pre renal is failure, yes, that's very good. And what action do you take now? You feel that it's renal failure, mm. you admit him, you, you ask him to take oral fluids with paracetamol and do platelets, you ask him to take oral fluids paracetamol and do daily PCV, you ask him to take oral fluids paracetamol, or you refer? Anyone? And why do you want to refer? Blood urea is it's only pre-renal. So the catch here is the urea is high, the creatinine is normal, it's all pre-renal. The key concept here is patient is vomiting and cannot take orally. So if you've not had history and background while interpreting the test, it's of no use. So in this patient, the, the indication for referral for admission was he would not be able to take orally and therefore you need to correct the pre-renal azotemia which would eventually go on settle into ATN. Right, so the way, best way to differentiate between pre-renal azotemia and, and ATN is you do a urinary sodium and a plasma sodium and urinary creatinine and a plasma creatinine and if you calculate the ratio if it is less than one it is more or less pre-renal where you can hydrate the patient and you could salvage the kidney otherwise if you don't hydrate these patients would eventually land up into ATN and this is what will happen <coughs> over the next two days if his creatinine increases and urea increases because he's, he's not been taking orally you land up with a diagnosis of ATN and it will probably land up on a dialysis so the same patient you could have salvaged by giving IV hydration would land up into ATN if you just feel that this is just moderate elevation of urea. You need to keep the history back in the mind. Now this is uh, a diabetic lady who is on, on multiple drugs and her creatinine is only 1.4 but her urinary protein is 4 plus and uh, she has uncontrolled sugars, HbA1c of 9.5. What do you do? Dr. Khera, I'd uh, yes, please last, ask you to, minute, yeah. ah, could yeah. you, we have yes. a minute more, yeah, minute and more. then we'll take two questions only. Yeah, this is the last, no last theme, right? <laughs> right, anyone, this is very interesting, so since this is the last theme, I've been cut short, there's, there's got to be a cache to this slide, there's a very key message here, so you could please read this for, for a 30 second odd. She has decreased appetite, decreased urine output, she's a type 2 diabetic on oral drugs, her blood pressure is 130 by 90, uh, her urinary protein is 4 plus, she has an HPA1C of 9.5, what do you do? Yes, yeah, I'll end with this uh, theme. I had a few more to throw at, but, but yes, uh, we'll end here. Refer to nephrologist. The reason being? Kidney, kidney function, poor kidney function. Right. So if I were to calculate urine EGFR. Plus HPA9.5. Right. That's why better to Is that the reason to refer to a nephrologist? That's for kidney fund digest. Protein 4 plus. Yeah, right. Right. So yeah, all of you are partly right here. So let me come to the reason. All diabetics who have heavy proteinuria, now this is the key, you see a lot of diabetics there and you keep on doing macroalbuminuria, but once in a while you'll find a patient where the protein levels are high. So all patients of diabetes who have heavy proteinuria, where you don't find retinopathy, where you find microhematuria on, on urine routine or the renal function is rapidly worsened as in this case, they need urgent kidney biopsy to establish a diagnosis. So this was important. I would just take it away and I'll just come back to my last slide. Can you have this?
Yeah. So what I wanted to convey here was you interpret renal functions keeping in view the history and the physical examination. You use the EGFR, which is very easy. It will give you the severity rather than the creatinine. It will help you label the disease. In all stage 3 CKD should be referred, onwards should be referred. <clears throat> a normal sized kidney can be seen in chronic kidney disease in a few scenarios. Dangerous hypercalcemia or hyperkalemia warrant urgent dialysis. Calcium supplementation should be judicious. It is being used rampantly. And uh, seek help when not sure. Okay, thank you.